if the host is interested and excited by a topic, the audience will hear it and they will react to it. And if the host is just calling it in, they'll hear that as well and they'll turn the show off. So what? I, so let me go back to why and how I'm doing this. I got off the air Tuesday. I was exhausted from it, dead from the whole the debate and the election. and I couldn't take another second of it. And I have good enough intuition in radio to tell you that if I'm at that point, so are you. The largest segment of the population doesn't want to hear anymore. Every second about the same thing, about who said what and who's up and who's down. So I had heard about that movie, so I went and saw The Big Short, and I was explaining what it was about and the housing bubble and how it collapsed and how it's going to happen again. And then last night, since I'm an avid television watcher, it's one of the things I do to relax. I, particular, I prefer movies and car shows uh, in this order. Car shows are my default shows, repairing cars on uh, Velocity. I always go there when I'm bored. I like guys who fix things and can do it. I, I enjoy it, frankly. And then I um, watch boxing matches if it's good. I like boxing matches. Watch them. I yeah, prefer a movie to anything. So last night there was a, a 90 hours of The Godfather, the original uh, with the uncut scenes. And you see you watch it for a few minutes to see if you see a scene you never saw. Who doesn't like watching that again for a few minutes? But then I stumbled upon the Madoff thing. I forgot it was on. I'd seen it somewhere. And it was on a, a network on ABC. I said, okay, yeah, I'll go for it. Because I'm interested in the Madoff scam story. Because I wasn't touched by it. In that I'm not an investor. I don't invest money in anything. I don't trust investments. I don't trust people with my money. <laughs> I'm one of these guys. I wish that banks were paying interest again. I'd rather have all my money in a bank. I mean, I even take 3% would be very nice. Give me a three and a, a two and a half even. Not a minus zero, a zero minus one, which is where they're going because of the false economy we're in. Why do you think we have zero interest? Why do you think that grandma in the Federal Reserve is keeping interest rates so low? Why do you think the World Bank is in a conspiracy with grandma in the, in the um, I'm sorry, the banking industry? Why do you think they're keeping interest rates at zero or less than zero? Because the whole thing is a Ponzi scheme about to collapse on us. And the minute that they permit a dime of interest to be made, what will happen is you'll put money in banks again and you'll try to make a little money on your interest, on, on, your, on your capital, and they don't want that. They want you to keep the money in the economy. They want you to keep pumping the money out by buying stuff that you don't really need. That's one of the theories of this kind of economic system that we're in right now. And eventually it has to come to a, to a crash. So I went to the movies Tuesday night to watch The Big Short, and that's what I was talking about. Then I saw Madoff last night. Can't wait for part two tonight on ABC, which I will watch instead of the so-called debate between the uh, commie and the criminal, which occurs at about the same time. And I'll watch the show again with him playing Madoff. I forget his name. I always forget his name. Richard Dreyfus, Dre Dreyface. I never liked the guy. I know there's something about him that gives me the creeps. He's the kind of guy I don't like. But he plays a character I actually despise, which is why I liked it, because he, he almost plays himself. He is a short, 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 pudgy, 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 nasty piece of work who disguises it with, a, with an overly ambitious smile on everyone to con them. And so you could start to believe that that's what Madoff was like, even though Madoff was taller, much taller than him. So what I'm saying is that's how I derived today's show, is from, the, from doing that. Now, can I promise you the same thing tomorrow? No. No, I can't. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. But let's go to the callers now on the Savage Nation in the housing bubble on the Madoff deal and uh, hear what people have to say about it. Let's go to KLIF in Dallas. Frank, go ahead, please. Topic and what happened to you? Yeah, Michael, I lost two houses during the uh, bubble. I actually lost one, and I'm in foreclosure on the second. And, and what year did this happen? Oh, it started about five years ago. Five years ago, but that was after the bubble. Well, uh, actually, 2008. Okay, so you got hit right at the at the peak of it. Yeah. So um, how did you get to buy the two houses? With nothing down or what? Well, I uh, had a dream of having my own business. Uh, so I went to the banks, and uh, Quicken Loans gave me two, two mortgages with no income verification. <laughs> I should have known something was up then, right? Okay, well, that's just what we're talking about. I said when I bought my first house in 74, I had to put down 20%. Yeah, my first house I did too. Uh, well, look, who doesn't want an easy fix? Who wouldn't take a mortgage for nothing down if they could get it during a rising market and take a gamble on a property? I mean, I hope you don't curse yourself for it. 
Oh, no, no. I, I wanted my own business, and it, it did get me that opportunity. Unfortunately, that uh, turned out sour. But was really funny, that second mortgage, both mortgages were uh, uh, then uh, changed hands to a GMAC. And uh, the second mortgage uh, kept me alive uh, because while they were foreclosing on my first house, I actually took out the line of credit <laughs> on my home, my original home. That's how crazy things were. And where are you today? Do you have a house today? Well, I'm in the same second house. It's been foreclosed on now. We've been fighting it for over two years. They finally got me in that stupid uh, home, whatever, safe, you know, that crazy plan they have, uh, the feds have. Uh, they gave me basically an offer that put everything at the end of it. And uh, uh, Well, I know this is int very interesting, what you just said. This is int intriguing politically, because what you just said to me is the feds have developed a way to keep you in your house. That's a very good thing, isn't it? Uh, I guess you, from the outside you can look at that, but in the, the bottom line to it is they have a, an asset that they claim is worth 550000 If I got 350 for this house right now, I'd be lucky. So they, they're Oh, no, I, I understand politically what you're saying, but don't you think it's better that you're actually in a house that you have some, some ownership in than, than being in the street? Well, to be honest with you, what we did was we said, hey, we want to, uh, uh, you know, try to save up some money, uh, and we just stopped paying, and uh, we fought it. So by finding it, you can drag it out longer. And uh, Well, thank God for the federal government, so I guess bailouts work for the individual as well as for corporations. <laughs> well, I don't think call. I want to talk about that for a minute. It's very important. I can't do it at the second, but we keep hearing government's bad, government's bad, government's bad, government's bad, government's bad, government's bad. I'm a conservative. I'm a conservative. Let them go in the gutter. Let them live in the gutter. They took a chance. They lost. Too bad. Let them go in the gutter. I'm sorry. There's something wrong with that mantra. So when you have a government that moves in and helps a person have a roof over their head, that's bad, too. That's not pure enough conservatism for you. You'd rather have people in the gutter living in a, in a cardboard box. See, this is the problem of people who live in theory rather than reality. Reality is the guy would rather stay in the house with government help than live in a cardboard box. Back in a minute. going to hear from, you, from the purists. It's a free market. Let the free market decide. Let the free market. Quack, quack, quack. Free market. They lost their house. It's too bad. Let the free market determine it. Free market. Quack. <laughs> you know, this sloganeering. I could come up with some slogans. Uh, cruise with cruise. Go on cruise control with cruise. I you stumped? Vote for Trump. Hate with Hillary. Sandals for Sanders. From Sandals to Sandals in one generation with Bernie Sanders. The loans that they made, my good friend Craig Smith writes, which they knew up front were bad, were referred to as ninja loans. Right, I remember that from the movie. No interest, no job, and no assets. You hear this? You put nothing down, never made a payment, and the originators knew the loans would fail. So they packaged the loan and sold them as securities. It was a, a fraudulent fiduciary instrument but we have them back again back again with fraudulent fiduciary instruments under the, under the great man in, in the white house you know here we are the same thing miss mr you you mr humanity how long has he worked now without a vacation he's been back from hawaii what a month he's he's overdue for one it's february 4th he must be taking another vacation soon after putting a tax on oil he just put announced a tax of ten dollars a barrel you hear this in order to save the environment he's putting a tax on something God, this guy is something. That's after selling us on, on Islam yesterday. I haven't even gotten to We'll have to wait for Friday for that one. And I have one thing to say about this whole thing with him with Islam. It's simple. And I said it before, but I have to repeat it in case it's forgotten. Very important. No other president in history has ever sold a religion like this one, sells, sells, sells Islam. Why, if the religion is so obviously a religion of peace, must he sell us on it day and night? If it's a religion of peace, you don't have to sell me on it. No one has to get up in the White House and tell me Buddhism is a religion of peace because I know it to be true. That's all. They don't have to get up every day. Uh, Buddhism is a religion of peace. Well, I know that. I've read the Buddhist uh, Bible, basically, because there is no Bible. It's a book of philosophy. I don't have to have anyone lecture me on Buddhism because I know what it is. Buddhists are peaceful, by and large. They leave everyone alone unless they're attacked and they're murderous killers. They understand. The, but they, you don't have a president getting up and lecturing me on Buddhism. 
Every day, uh, Buddhism as a religion of peace. And re no one's doing that. How come he's selling me on Islam as a religion of peace? If it was obviously a religion of peace, would he have to sell it every day the same way? This is why I don't buy it. And this is why I'm offended by it. Because no president should sell a religion as he does Islam. And you know why, don't you? It goes all the way back to the madrasas, the mother, who, uh, you know, do I have to tell you the whole story again, the psychological story? It's in uh, two books ago I wrote about the psychology. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. I get a scripture lesson every morning from uh, a minister that I have a really <laughs> close personal relationship with. And, you know, it just gets me grounded. He gets up really early, sends it to me. So, you know, there it is in my inbox at 5 a.m. I have friends who are rabbis who send me notes, Oy give vey. me uh, readings uh, that are going to be discussed um, in uh, services. So I really appreciate all that incoming. Oh, it's nauseating. That's Hillary Clinton on spirituality. Now, if you believe she gets a scripture lesson every morning from a minister that she has a really close personal relationship with, who could it be? Reverend Bill? Or is it Reverend Wright? And it gets her grounded. He gets up really early to send it to me. So, you know, there it is in my inbox at 5 a.m. Uh, we'd like to know what's in the outbox of your emails, Hillary. That's what we're really interested in. Not from the uh, reverend that sends you something at 5 a.m. I love she has friends who are rabbis. You want to name them? Which communist rabbi you're talking to? There's an awful lot of them out there who hate America. I'm sure you get plenty of stuff from them. They're all over Berkeley. But the best scream on spirituality was Bernie Sanders, who was suddenly a very uh, religious man. He doesn't say what religion it is, but he's a very religious man. He means the religion of Karl Marx. Very strong. I can't do it unless he's... I got to do it. Listen to him to, mim to, to mimic him. I got to hear the voice. Uh, to me, I would not be here tonight. I would not be running for president of the United States if I did not have very strong religious and spiritual strong. Uh, feelings. What uh, religion is it? I Wait, believe stop. that... Bernie, Bernie, stop. If you say you have strong religious and spiritual feelings, can you please tell us what religious feelings they are? What do you mean feelings? What do you mean by feelings? You could say you're spiritual, but what do you mean by you have strong religious feelings? What are those feelings? Usually religion is not a feeling. It's a practice, you schmendrick. If you're religious, you practice a religion. That's what that means. If you're spiritual, you could say you have feelings because that means nothing. That's filled with San Francisco spiritual people. They run around with feathers in their nostrils in order to avoid having to smell what's in the streets. All right, let's go to the callers here on the Savage Nation. Anything but the uh, political thing. No, there's a couple of good sound bites I missed, so these are terrific. I don't want to go off the sound yet. The Goldman Sachs $675,000 one. Here's Mark Cuban and his opinion on uh, the election in clip 15. Let's hear now, it. I think Donald's softening up some. You know, I've talked to him on the phone a couple times, and when you know Donald, he's kind of got a different personality than what he plays on TV, and it's kind of don't hate the player, hate the game um, type situation. But I haven't made a decision yet, but, you know, I'll consider anybody but Ted Cruz. Wonder why. Why would he say a thing like that? What does he have against uh, cruising with Cruz, I wonder? I don't even know. I know Mark Cuban's a, a sport. He owns a sporting team, right? Honestly, don't. I mean, I know he's very important and very wealthy. That's all I know. I read his name. I know he doesn't own Cuba, but I mean, what does he own? Does he own? Does he own Cuba as well? I mean, he could buy Cuba probably for less money than his team. <laughs> Mark, you know, think about the naming rights for that one. People pay a fortune to have naming rights to a building. If he could buy Cuba from the Castro brothers, who could then flee and move to Hungary or wherever they originally came from before their family landed in Cuba, he wouldn't have to buy naming rights. The whole nation is named for him. I'm just thinking out loud how these things work, talking about real estate. What an investment that would be to buy a country which has, which has your name. <laughs> okay, callers, KVOR, KSFO, BOB, ABC, KERN, KSFO, WABC, KSFO, Darren, you're calling about Madoff. What happened to you? Hi, Michael. Uh, yeah, what happened to me was, uh, well, I, I got involved in the real estate and the Madoff stuff, but I sold my real estate just before the market went down, and I had a pile of money, and then my grandmother's estate settled finally, and she had put her money in a trust for my parents, 
And what happened was we needed a safe place to put our money 